the ninth in our series of complete performances of the operas of Gilbert and Sullivan. Today's opera is Radigal, or The Witch's Curse.
Today, we have invited you to join us in Cornwall at the end of the Napoleonic Wars. We are in the tiny fishing village of Red Erin, and as we stand here, looking down the steep slope towards the little harbour, with its fishing boats lying motionless in the sun, the only movement to be seen is that of the occasional swan gliding across the placid water. It is difficult to imagine that this place could be the scene of any supernatural occurrence. But just now the village sleeps peacefully, as it were, exhausted by the heat. But wait a moment. I think the peace is about to be disturbed, for over there I can see a group of young girls who seem to be dressed as, as bridesmaids. They are making for that little whitewashed cottage with a thatched roof and well-kept garden. Old Dame Hannah lives there with the lovely orphan Rose Maybud. Let's go a little closer. Gentle maidens, you sing well but vainly, for Rose is still heart-free and looks but coldly upon her many suitors. Oh, it's very disappointing, Dame Hannah. Every young man in the village is in love with her, but they are appalled by her beauty and modesty and won't declare themselves. So until she makes her own choice, there's no chance for anybody else. This is perhaps the only village in the world that possesses an endowed corps of professional bridesmaids who are bound to be on duty every day from ten to four. And it is at least six months since our services were required. The pious charity by which we exist is practically wasted. We shall be disendowed. That will be the end of it. 
Helen, Hannah, you're a nice old person. You could marry if you like. But there's old Adam, Robin's faithful servant. He loves you with all the frenzy of a boy of 14. Nay, that may never be, for I am pledged to, to whom? To an eternal maidenhood. Oh. Many years ago, I was betrothed to a godlike youth who wooed me under an assumed name. But on the very day upon which our wedding was to have been celebrated, I discovered that he was no other than Sir Roderick Murgatroyd, one of the bad baronets of Ruddigore, <gasps> and the uncle of the man who now bears that title. As a son of that accursed race, he was no husband for an honest girl. So, madly as I loved him, I left him then and there. He died but ten years since, but I never saw him again. But why should you not marry a bad baronet of Ruddigore? All baronets are bad, but was he worse than other baronets? My child, he was a curse. <gasps> but who cursed him? Not you, I trust. The curse is on all his line, and has been ever since the time of Sir Rupert, the first baronet. <gasps> Listen, and you shall hear the legend. away, dear Rose, on some errand of charity, as is thy wont. A few gifts, dear aunt, for deserving villagers. Lo, here is some peppermint rock for old Gaffer Gadaby, a set of false teeth for pretty little Ruth Rowbottom, and a pound of snuff for the poor orphan girl on the hill. Ah, Rose, pity that so much goodness should not help to make some gallant youth happy for life. Rose. 
Why dost thou harden that little heart of thine? Is there none here away whom thou couldst love? And if there were such an one, verily, it would ill become me to tell him so. Nay, dear one, where true love is, there is little need of prim formality. Hush, dear aunt, for thy words pain me sorely. Hung in a plated dish cover to the knocker of the workhouse door, with naught that I could call mine own, save a change of baby linen and a book of etiquette. Little wonder if I have always regarded that work as a voice from a parent's tomb. This hallowed volume, composed, if I may believe the title page, by no less an authority than the wife of a Lord Mayor, has been through life my guide and monitor. By its solemn precepts, I have learned to test the moral worth of all who approach me. The man who bites his bread, or eats peas with a knife, I look upon as a lost creature. And he who has not acquired the proper way of entering and leaving a room is the object of my pitying horror. There are those in this village who bite their nails, dear aunt, and nearly all are wont to use their pocket combs in public places. In truth, I could pursue this painful theme much further, but behold, I have said enough. But is there not one among them who is faultless in thine eyes? For example, young Robin. He combines the manners of a Marquis with the morals of a Methodist. Couldst thou not love him? And even if I could, how should I confess it unto him? For lo, he is shy, and saith naught. <laughs>
did the good soul think when she breathed the hallowed name of Robin that he would do even as well as another. But he resembleth all the youths in this village in that he is unduly bashful in my presence. And lo, it is hard to bring him to the point. But soft, he is here. Mistress Rose. Master Robin. I wish to say that it is fine. It is passing fine. But we do want rain. I sorely. Is that all? That is all. Good day, Master Robin. Good day, Mistress Rose. I, I beg pardon. pardon I... You were about to say? I would fain consult you. Truly? It is about a friend. In truth, I have a friend myself. Indeed. I mean, of course. And I would fain consult you. About him? About her. Let us consult one another. I know a youth who loves a little maid. Hey, but his face is a sight for to see. Silent is he, for he is modest and afraid. Hey, but he's timid as a youth can be. I know a maid who loves a gallant Sickens as the days go by. She cannot tell him all the sad, sad truth. Hey, but I think that little maid will die. Poor little man. Poor little maid. Poor little man. Poor little maid. Now tell me, pray, and tell me too. And he cannot sleep. Hey, but his face is a sight for to see. Daily he goes for to wail, for to weep. Hey, but he's a wretched as a youth can be. She is very thin and she is very pale. Hey, but she sickens as the days go by. Daily she goes for to weep, for to wail. I think that little maid will die. Poor little maid. Poor little man. Poor little maid. Poor little man. Now tell me, pray, and tell me too, what in the world? should offer her my name. Hey, but her face is a sight for to see. If I were the maid, yes. I should fan his honest flame. Hey, but he's bashful as a youth can be. If I were the youth, I should speak to her today. Hey, but she sickens as the days go by. If I were the maid, I would meet the lad halfway, for I really do believe that timid youth will die. Poor little man, poor little maid, poor little man, poor little maid, I thank you, miss, for your counsel. I'll tell that way what she ought to 
Poor child. I sometimes think that if she wasn't quite so particular, I might venture... But no. No, even then I should be unworthy of her. My kind master is sad. Ah, oh, Adam. Dear Sir Riven Murgatroyd, Hush, I... as you love me, breathe not that hated name. Uh, Twenty years ago, in horror at the prospect of inheriting that hideous title, and with it the ban that compels all who succeed to the baronetcy to commit at least one deadly crime per day for life, I fled my home and concealed myself in this innocent village under the name of Robin O'Cappell. My younger brother, Despard, believing me to be dead, succeeded to the title and its attendant curse. For twenty years I have been dead and buried. Don't, don't dig me up now. Dear master, it shall be as you wish, for have I not sworn to obey you forever in all things? Mm -hmm. Yet, as we're here alone, let me call you by your own right title once more. Oh, very well. <laughs> Sir Riven Murgatroyd, Baronet of Radigal. It's like eight hours of the seaside. My poor old friend. Would there were more like you. Would there were indeed. Uh, but but I, I bring you good tidings. Your foster brother Richard has returned from sea. His ship, the Tom Tit, rides yonder at anchor, and he himself is even now in this very village. My beloved foster brother. No, no, it, it cannot be. It, it is even be. so. And see, he comes this way. She proved to be a frigate, and she up with a port, and fires with a 32. It come and come and near, but we answered with a cheer, which paralyzed the poly boo, you see, which paralyzed the poly boo. Which paralyzed the poly boo, you see, which paralyzed the poly boo. Then I kept me up, and he says, says he, this chap we need not fear. We can take her if we like, she's certain for the strike, for she's only a darn man fear, you see, she's only a darn man fear. But to fight a French falal, it's our kitchen of a gal, it's a lovely thing for the do. For we with all our hogs, while we're sturdy British folks, while she's only a poor poly do, you see, while she's only a poor poly do. While she's only a poor poly you see, she's only a poor poly do. So we up with our helm and we scud before the breeze as we give the compassionating cheer. Froggy answers with a shout as he sees us go about, which was grateful of the poor man's fear, you see, which was grateful of the poor man's fear. And I'll wager in their joy they kiss each other's cheek, which is what them foreigners do. And they bless their lucky stars, we were hardy British cars who had pity on a poor Polly who, you see. Who had pity on a poor Polly Who? Who had pity on a poor Polly Who? You see? Who had pity on a poor Polly Who? Ha <laughs> 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 
My beloved foster brother and very dearest friend, welcome home again after ten long years at sea. It is such deeds as you have just described that cause our flag to be loved and dreaded throughout the civilized world. Why, Lord, love ye, Rob, that's but a trifle to what we have done in the way of sparing life. I believe I may say without exaggeration that the merciful little Tom Tate has spared more French frigates than any craft afloat. But tain't for a British seaman to brag, so I'll just stow me joint tackle and belay. But vast heaving, messmate, what's brought you all a cockbill? Alas, Dick, I love Rose Maybud and love in vain. You love in vain? Oh, 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 calm, that's too good. Why, you're a fine, strapping, muscular young fella. Tall and strong as a tagallon mast, taut as a forestay. Aye, and a baronite to boot, if all had their rights. Hush, Richard, not a word about my true rank, which none here suspect. Yes, I know well enough that few men are better calculated to win a woman's heart than I. I'm a fine fellow, Dick, and worthy any woman's love. Happy the girl that gets me, say I. But I'm timid, Dick. Shy, nervous, modest, retiring, diffident. And I cannot tell her, Dick, I cannot tell her. Ah, you've no idea what a poor opinion I have of myself and how little I deserve it. Robin... Do you call to mind how years ago we swore that, come what might, we would always act upon our heart's dictates? Aye, Dick, and I've always kept that oath. In doubt, difficulty and danger, I've always asked my heart what I should do, and it has never failed me. Right. Let your heart be your compass with a clear conscience for your binnacle light, and you'll sail ten knots on a bowl and clear of shoals, rocks, and quicksands. Well, now... What does my heart say in this here difficult situation? Why? It says, Dick, it says. It calls me Dick, because it's known me from a babby. <laughs> Dick, it says. You ain't shy. You ain't modest. Speak you up for him as is. For me? Robin, me lad, just you lay me alongside. And when she's becalmed under me lee, I'll spin her a yarn that shall serve to fish you two together for life. Will you do this thing for me? Can you, do you think? Yes, there's no false modesty about you. You're what I would call a bumptious self-assertiveness. Huh? I mean the expression in its complimentary sense. Oh. Has already made you a boatswain's mate. And it will make an admiral of you in time if you work it properly, you dear incompetent old imposter. <laughs> my dear fellow, I give my right arm for one-tenth of your modest assurance. <laughs> My boy, you may take it from me that of all the afflictions accursed with which a man saddled and hampered and addled and diffident and nature the worst. Though clever as clever can be, a crichton of early romance, you must stir it and stump it and blow your own trumpet or trust me, you haven't a chance. If you wish in the world to advance your merit, you're bound to enhance. You must stir it and stump it and blow your own trumpet or trust me, you haven't a chance. Now take, for example, my case. I've a bright intellectual brain. In all London City, there's no one so witty I've thought to again and again. I've a highly intelligent face. My features cannot be denied. But whatever I try, sir, I fail in and rise, sir. I'm modestly personified. If you wish in the world to advance your merit, your bound to enhance, you must stir it and stamp it and blow your own trumpet, or trust me, you have the chance. As a poet, I'm tender and quaint. I passion and fervor and grace. From Ovid and Horace to Swinburne and Morris, they all of them take a back pace. Then I sing and I play and I paint, though none are accomplished as I. To say so much reason, you ask me the reason. I'm divid and modest and shy. If you wish in the world to advance your merit, your bound to enhance, you must stir it and stamp it and blow your own trumpet, or trust me, you have the chance. If you wish in the world to advance your merit, your bound to enhance, you must stir it and stamp it and blow your own trumpet, or trust me, you have the chance. Ah, it's a thousand pities he's such a poor opinion of himself, for a finer fella don't walk. Well, I'll do my best for him. Plead for him, as though it was for your own father. That's what my heart to remark to me just now. Oh, but here she comes. Steady, steady it is. By the port admiral, but she's a tight little craft. Uh, uh, come, come, she's not for you. And yet, She's fit to marry Lord Nelson. 
By the flag of old England, I, I, I can't look at her unmoved. Sir, you are agitated. Aye, aye, my lass, well said. I am agitated, true enough. Took flat aback, my girl. But tis not, twill pass. This here heart of mine's a dictating to me like anything. Question is, have I a right to disregard its promptings? Can I do aught to relieve thine anguish? For it seemeth to me that thou art in sore trouble. This apple? No, my lass, taint that. I'm... I'm took flat aback. Par buckle me if you ain't the loveliest gal I ever set eyes on. There, I can't say fairer than that, can I? No. The question is, is it meet that an utter stranger should thus express himself? Now, what says my book of etiquette? Yes, always speak the truth. I'd no thoughts of saying this here to you on my own account, for truth to tell, I was chartered by another. But when I see you, me heart it up, and it says, says it, this is the very last for you, Dick. Speak up to her, Dick, it says. It calls me Dick, because we was at school together. Tell her all, Dick, it says. Never sail under false colours. It's mean. That's what me heart tells me to say, and in my rough, common sailor fashion, I've said it. And I'm awaiting for your reply. I'm a trembling, miss. Looky here. That's nervousness. Now, how should a maiden deal with such an one? Keep no one in unnecessary suspense. Behold, I will not keep you in unnecessary suspense. Accepting an offer of marriage, do so with apparent hesitation. I take you, but with a certain show of reluctance, avoid any appearance of eagerness. Though you will bear in mind that I am far from anxious to do so, a little show of emotion will not be misplaced. Pardon this tear. Rose, you've made me the happiest blue jacket in England. I wouldn't change places with the Admiral of the Fleet, no matter who he's a hugging off at this present moment. But, action your pardon, miss, might I be permitted to salute the flag I'm going to sail under? An engaged young lady should not permit too many familiarities. Once. Ah. The best of war is over, oh my love. Embrace my tender lover, oh my love. From tempest wealth up from war the long. Oh, give me shelter with thee.
Well, what news? Have you spoken to her? Aye, my lad, I have, so to speak, spoke her. And she refuses? Why, no, I can't truly say she do. Then she accepts my darling. What should a maiden do when she is embraced by the wrong gentleman? Belay, me lad, belay. You, you don't understand. Oh, sir, belay. I beseech you. You see, it's like this. She accepts, but it's me. You. Hail the bridegroom, hail the bride. Let them up. Hold your tongues, will you? Now then, what does this mean? My poor lad, my heart grieves for thee, but it's like this. The moment I see her, and just as I was a going to mention your name... My heart, it up and it says, says it, Dick, you fell in love with her yourself, it says. Be honest and sailor-like, don't skulk under false colours. Speak up, it says. Take her, you dog, and with her, my blessing. Hey, will you be quiet? Go away! Vulgar girls. What could I do? I'm bound to obey my heart's dictates. Of course, no doubt. It's quite right. I don't mind. That is, not... Particularly, only it's... It is disappointing, you know. Oh, but, sir, I knew not that thou didst seek me in wedlock, or in very truth I should not have hearkened unto this man. For, behold, he is but a lowly mariner, and very poor withal, whereas thou art a tiller of the land, and thou hast fat oxen, and many sheep and swine, a considerable dairy farm, and much corn and oil. Yeah, that's true, my lass, but it's done now, ain't it, Rob? Still, it may be that I should not be happy in thy love. I am passing young and little able to judge. Moreover, as to thy character, I know naught. Nay, Rose, I'll answer for that. Dick has won thy love fairly. Broken-hearted as I am, I'll stand up for Dick through thick and thin. Thank ye, messmate. That's well said. That's spoken honest. Thank ye, Rob. Yet methinks I have heard that sailors are but worldly men and little prone to lead serious and thoughtful lives. And what then? Admit that Dick is not a steady character and that when he's excited he uses language that would make your hair curl. Grant that he does. It's the truth and I'm not going to deny it. But look at his good qualities. He's as nimble as a pony and his hornpipe is the talk of the fleet. <laughs> there, and that's only a bit of it. <laughs> Thank you, Rob. That's well spoken. Thank you, Rob. But it may be that he drinketh strong waters which do bemuse a man and make him even as the wild beasts of the desert. Well, suppose he does, and I don't say he don't, for rum's his bane and ever has been. He does drink, I won't deny it. Mm. But what of that? Look at his arms. <laughs> Tattooed to the shoulder. <laughs> No, no, I won't hear a word against Dick. But they say that mariners are but rarely true to those whom they profess to love. Granted, granted. I don't say that Dick isn't as bad as any of them. <laughs> you are, you know you are, you dog, a devil of a fellow, a regular out-and-out Lothario. <laughs> but what then? You can't have everything, and a better hand at turning in a dead eye don't walk a deck. And what an accomplishment that is in a family man. No, no, not a word against Dick. I'll stick up for him through thick and thin. Thank you, Rob. Thank you. You're a true friend. I've acted according to my heart's dictates and such orders as them no man should disobey.
Rose and Robin leave, arm in arm, while Richard is left to wander off alone, feeling very sorry for himself. But now comes the strange figure of a young girl clad in picturesque tatters. Her feet are bare, and her long hair falls wildly about her shoulders. Her name is Margaret. Mad Margaret, the villagers call her.
all to soften thy sorrow. This apple? No. Tell me, are you mad? I? No. That is, I think not. That's well. Then you don't love Sir Despard Murgatroyd. All mad girls love him. I love him. I'm poor mad Margaret. Crazy Meg. Poor Peg. <laughs> Thou lovest the bad baronet of Ruddigal. Oh, horrible, too horrible. You pity me. Then be my mother. The squirrel had a mother, but she drank and the squirrel fled. Hush. They sing a brave song in our parts. It runs somewhat thus. The cat and the dog and the little puppy sat down in a, down in a, in a... I forget what they sat down in, but so the song goes. Listen. I've come to pinch her. Mercy. Whom? You mean who? Nay, it is the accusative after the verb. True. I have come... To pinch Rose Maybud. Rose Maybud? I, I love him. He loved me once, but that's all gone. Fish. He gave me an Italian glance and made me his. He will give her an Italian glance and make her his. But it shall not be, for I'll stamp on her, stamp on her, stamp on her. Did you ever kill anybody? Hmm? No? Why not? Listen. I killed a fly this morning. It buzzed and I wouldn't have it, so it died. Pop! So shall she. But behold, I am Rose Maybud, and I would fain not die. Pop! You are Rose Maybud. Yes, sweet Rose Maybud. Strange, they told me she was beautiful. And he loves you. No, no, if I thought that, I would treat you as the auctioneer and land agent treated the ladybird. I would rend you asunder. I may be pacified. <laughs> For behold, I am pledged to another, and lo, we are to be wedded this very day. Swear me that. Come to a commissioner and let me have it on affidavit. I once made an affidavit, but it died. It died. It died. But see, they come, said Despard and his evil crew. Hide, hide. They are all mad. Quite mad. What makes you think that? Hush. They sing choruses in public. That's mad enough, I think. Go, hide away, or they will seize you. Hush. Quite softly. Quite, quite softly.
and sad. And why am I fearfully mad? Because I am sorry bad. You'll see that once in my face. Oh, why am I happy and hot? It's the workings of conscience, of course. And asking you stand for him most. At least it does so in my case. When in crime one is fully employed, your expression gets warped and destroyed. It's a penalty none can avoid. I once was a nice looking youth, but like stone from a strong catapult, I rushed at my terrible cult. Observe the unpleasant result. Indeed, I am telling the truth. Oh, innocent, happy, so poor. If I had been first, just I'm sure, like I should be as nice looking as you're. Maybe. You are very nice looking indeed. Oh, innocent, listening time. A final existence of crime. And now, if you please, we'll proceed. <laughs> Poor children, how they loathe me. Me, whose hands are certainly steeped in infamy, but whose heart is as the heart of a little child. But what is a poor baronet to do when a whole picture gallery of ancestors step down from their frames and threaten him with an excruciating death if he hesitate to commit his daily crime? But, ha ha! I am even with them. I get my crime over the first thing in the morning, and then, <laughs> for the rest of the day, I do good, I do good, I do good. Two days since, I stole a child and built an orphan asylum. Yesterday, I robbed a bank and endowed a bishopric. Today, I carry off Rose Maybud and atone with a cathedral. This is what it is to be the sport and toy of a picture gallery. But I will be bitterly revenged upon them. I will give them all to the nation, and nobody shall ever look upon their faces again. Ask your honest pardon, but... Ah, observed. And by a mariner. What would you with me, fellow? Your honor, I'm a... Poor man of war's man, becalmed in the doldrums. I don't know them. And I make bold to ask your honor's advice. Does your honor know what it is to have a heart? My honor knows what it is to have a complete apparatus for conducting the circulation of the blood through the veins and arteries of the human body. Aye, but has your honor a heart that ups and looks you in the face and gives you quarter-deck orders that it's life and death to disobey? I have not a heart of that description, but I have a picture gallery that presumes to take that liberty. Well, your honor... It's like this. Your honor had an elder brother. It had. Who should have inherited your title and with it, its curse. Aye, but he died. Oh, Reuben! He didn't. He did not? He didn't. On the contrary, he lives in this here very village <gasps> under the name of... <laughs> Understand? I think I do. With bigger and second, the steps will be taken. It's neatly planned. I think so too. I readily bet that you'll never regret it. For duty, duty must be done. The rule applies to everyone. And people will bet duty means to shirk the task of business. To shirk the task of business. To shirk the task of business.
bridegroom come, likewise the bride. The maidens are very elated and merry. They are her chum. To dash the bride were almost a pity, the pity committee. But duty, duty must be done to rule the prize to everyone. And then, although the duty be, reject the task of pity, 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 pity, pity.
I claim young Robin and my elder brother. His rightful title I have long enjoyed. I claim him as the reason for God's void. I would speak consciously, I could, but I cannot.
one just like you, now that I've reformed, how I adore. Oh, <laughs> 